Okay, so then, so today I'm going to discuss with you all the Malaysia legal system, the basic Malaysia legal system. So I'm going to introduce you all as to what actually the law that uh, give power to us to do certain things and uh, what law actually prohibit us from not doing certain things. Okay, first of all, student, we are going to look at the classification of law. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you look at your slide, the classification of law, there are three types of classification of law, which is actually private law, public law, and also international law. Okay, the private law, which is also known as the civil law, this law actually is the law with regards to the relationship between one citizen and another citizen. So, meaning these are the type of law which comprise an action which is being taken by one individual against another individual. So, that's why an example that I put there is a law of contract, law of thought, law of trust, family law, a partnership. These are all actually civil law. So, that's why the person who actually filed the action is known as the plaintiff and the person who actually is defending the action is known as the defendant. So, let's say this is a family law with regards to a custody matter between Ahmad and Amina. So, let's say Amina is the one who is filing for the custody of a child. So, the case will be Amina versus Ahmad, whereby Amina is a plaintiff and, and Ahmad is the defendant. So, that is a family matters. So, let's say if this is a land matters, okay? This is a land law. There is a dispute between the landowner, okay? And another person who is actually claiming the land from him. So, let's say the other person is actually Zakaria. So, Zakaria is claiming a land which belongs to, let's say, Sahid. So, the case will be Zakaria versus Sahid. Zakaria will be the plaintiff and Sahid will be the defendant. Sometimes, we can also uh, find that there are cases between organizations, let's say between Cellcom and Zaliha. So, let's say Zaliha did not pay his bill, her bills, okay, and uh, Cellcom is taking action against Zaliha. So, the case will be Cellcom versus Zaliha. So, student, you will be asking me that Cellcom is truly not an individual. However, under the law, Cellcom is a legal entity. So, Cellcom is, under the law, is being regarded as an individual which is being created by the law. And then under the situation, under the situation, the case is being taken by Cellcom, just similar to an individual. So what actually is a public law? So a public law is a law which concerns between a citizen of the state and the state and the country. So the state is the one who is responsible to take care of the welfare of a citizen. So, the most popular public law is a criminal law. So, under criminal law, let's say this is a murder case. Who will take action? Who will actually charge the person who commit the crime? It is the government. But then you say the police is the one who will capture the, the criminal. So, the police actually acts as the agent of the government. Okay? Actually, the police did not acts on their own wheels. They act because they are being paid. They are actually the agent, the employee of the government. So, the case will be like this. The PP, PP is a public prosecutor, Pandawa Raya, versus, let's say, Smith Hogan. Okay, let's say Smith Hogan is the person who is being charged with certain offense, with a, with a criminal offense. Okay? So, PP actually, the public prosecutor, is acting on behalf of the government. So, this is criminal law. However, apart from criminal law, we have administrative law, we have constitutional law. All these concern the government. So, administrative law will ensure that 
the the administrative all of all these government department will run smoothly okay so uh whereby constitutional law this talk about the structure of the government the rights of the citizen in that country so all these cases will be taken by the state on behalf actually of the of the citizen of that country so this is known as public law then the third classification is actually international law so international law we have private international law and also public international law so private international law are law which concerns which affect a conflict which which occur between one country and another country an example is the case of batu puti okay so in the case of batu puti there is a conflict of law between malaysia and also singapore dispute arise with regard to this for uh, uh, with regards to the claim towards pulau batu puti so this is known as private international law because it does not involve the whole world okay it involves certain countries only yeah, where we got certain dispute between that country so this is a private international law so what is actually a public international law a public international law so this look at the law which prevails on that country if the said country have signed certain treaties certain agreement uh, under certain um exactly the, the good example is united nations okay so if we sign certain agreement with other country at united nations an example is with regards to refugees so since we did not agree and we did not sign anything any treaties we did not sign so that's why actually we did not recognize refugees and and we cannot be forced to accept them because we did not agree we not, did not sign that treaties Okay, that that agreement, that deeds, that document. So this is known as public international law because this in this involves many countries in 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 a, a, a organization which is accept globally. Okay, okay. So let us go on with the uh, next next slide. This is the sources of law. Sources of law. We are going to look at what are the law which we use in Malaysia as our sources. Okay, so actually we have two main sources, which is the written law and also the unwritten law. So the written law, these are the law whereby we can identify who are the bodies, the organization, or the person which actually made the law which enact the law meaning these bodies this organization they are being given power to enact law okay we can we can we can actually identify who actually is the maker of the law so this is known as the written written law <coughs> whereas for unwritten law these are the types of law whereby we can, couldn't could not identify who is actually the maker of the law okay so written law in malaysia we have five types of written law which is the federal constitution the 13th constitution of the state the federal laws which is made by parliament the state laws which is made by the state assemblies the federal and state subsidiary legislation whereas unwritten law we have three types of unwritten law which is a judicial edition the principles of english law and also customary and islamic law so now, student, let us have a look at our federal constitution first. So this federal constitution, this is the supreme law of the land. This is the main law in Malaysia, meaning, you know, if we look at Article 4 of the federal constitution, because this is the supreme law of the land, okay? So we did not, we did not read it as sectioned, okay? So if we refer to, let's say, the uh, Traffic Act, we will read the provision of that statute. Uh, we are going, this law, this legislation, we call them a statute. Because we cannot call them as books, cannot call them as novel. Why? Because if this is a book, we know who is actually the author of the book. 
Okay. However, a statute does not have an author. A statute need to go certain process before it is being accepted as law. Okay. So this statute, a federal constitution is, is a statute. <coughs> because this is the main law of the land. This is the supreme law of the land. Okay. So the provision inside the federal constitution is known as article. And under Article 4, one of the provisions of the Constitution, it says that if there is any other law which contradicts or contravenes with the Constitution, that that law will become null and void. Okay? Okay. So, that's why other law need to be, need to be, uh, not beyond the Constitution. So, meaning if it's not allowed by the Constitution, then that law cannot be enforced. It becomes null and void. So, however, there are certain law whereby, though it contravenes or contradict the provision of the Constitution, however, this law is still valid. Why? Not because it is being allowed by the Constitution itself. So, under Article 162 of the Constitution, these refer to those law which is being enacted before we gain independence, before 1957. It is a very old law. So, meaning if this law is still in existence and it's not being repealed, the belong the Mansokan. So, while law pun, uh, do actually, it contradicts the provision of the, of the state law, contradict the Constitution, it will still be a valid law. Okay? And then we have Article 149 of the Constitution, whereby under Article 149, this refer to the subversive law. So if, let's say, certain law is going to be enacted uh, to cater these subversive matters, uh, to cater terrorism, let's say, and this actually go against the fundamental rights which is being stated uh, under the Constitution, will it be valid? Yes, it will still be valid because it is allowed under Section 149. Okay? So, under, under Article 1450, uh, this is with regard to the proclamation of emergency. Darurat. Eh, pengetiaran darurat. <clears throat> Who can actually declare emergency? Yeah, the, the ruler. So, for the whole Malaysia, is the Riyadu Pertuan Agong. And for the state, it's actually the serpent, uh, the uh, ruler of the state. During that, that time of proper proclamation of emergency, if any law is being enacted, and that law actually is against the constitution, that law will still be a valid, valid law. Okay, now, let us have a look at the state constitution. So, just now, we discussed about the federal constitution, and the, inside the federal constitution, it's discussed about the structure of the uh, government, and also the rights of the citizens inside uh, inside, inside, inside the country, inside Malaysia. So the state constitution. So we have thirteen states, right? So every state have their own constitution, and this constitution of the state it only govern that state alone. Okay. So let's take an uh, example. Uh, Para Para have its own constitution, and this state constitution it discuss only a certain matters which actually peculiar to that to the state. In most of the time, the succession to the throne, who can become the sultan, who will become the chief minister, the menteri besar, okay? So that's why you can see that certain state, the provision is different. Like Penang, the chief minister can of Penang, can be a non-Malay. However, in Para, the menteri besar must be a Malay. Why? Because it is being stated inside the state constitution. And that's why you say, you, you can see that certain state, like Johor, okay? The Tengku Mahkota will become the king. However, in Negeri Sembilan, it will be decided by the the Boa, the Lua, the 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 uh, the Undang. They decided because this is being stated there in their their, their state constitution. Okay, student. So okay, so I'm going to discuss uh, federal law to this uh, and uh, the rest of the and the rest uh, of of the written law. Okay. So, um, please listen carefully so that uh, you can uh, actually differentiate what is a federal law, what is a state law, and whether subsidiary legislation 
It have to do with these two law at the federal. Okay, so now let us look at federal law. What is actually federal law? For this federal law, these are the law which is being enacted by the parliament, by the House of Representatives. Okay, the Dewan Rakyat. So after we gain independence, how to differentiate between whether this is a federal law or whether this is state law? So after independence, this federal law is known as act, whereas state law is known as enactment. However, in um, Sarawak, yeah, in Sarawak, the uh, state law in Sarawak it is known as ordinance. However, if for 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 the whole of Malaysia, if we uh, realize that the law is known as uh, let's say traffic ordinance, so meaning these are those law which is being enacted before independence. Because after independence, all the statute is known as act. So, and this statute, which is known as act, which is being enacted after we gain independence, so all this is all the statute. It covers uh, the whole of Malaysia. Because it's being enacted by the um, uh, House of Representatives, whereas. State law, these are all those uh, law which is being enacted by the Leg Legislative Assembly, the Dewan Undangan Negeri, and is known as enactment. However, I've told you earlier, for Sarawak, it's known as ordinance. So, then you will be saying that, well, uh, won't there be a conflict since the federal government can enact law and then the, the, the state also can enact law? There are certain law which is within the jurisdiction of the federal government and there are certain law which is within the jurisdiction of the state. So uh, certain law, so we, we are going to, we are going to look through whether this law belongs to the jurisdiction of the federal government or whether it belongs to the jurisdiction of the state government. So it's being uh, state set under the uh, constitution which are the types of law which can be enacted by the federal government and which are the types of law which can be enacted by the state government. So the Sharia law actually falls under the state government. Okay, The local authorities, land matters, uh, these are the uh, example of law which is within the jurisdiction of the state government to enact this kind of law. And then we have subsidiary legislation. A subsidiary legislation, the Undang Undang Kecil, these are the bylaw, the uh, law which is being enacted, there must be a main law. So example is Akta UITM, UITM Act. And then we have the Pekeliling, the regulations. Pekeliling, they were Makan Pekeliling, uh, many other Pekeliling, okay? So all these is known as the subsidiary legislation. So that why actually we have the main legislation, which is the federal law and the state law, and then we still have the subsidiary legislation. We have the Unna Unna Kecil. So the main law discuss about the main uh, the main issue. Okay. So Parliament and the uh, State Legislative Assembly, they are not an expertise in certain field. Okay. So. Uh, Let's say the Education Act. So all those people which is at the House of Representatives, they are not an expert with regards to education. So meaning they are going to enact law with regards to the main issue. So and then the details like the people who is actually an expertise in that field do it. Okay, so that's why we have subsidiary legislation. So let's say for the state law we have Undang Undang Keluarga Islam Perak. So this is the state law which is being enacted by the State Assembly. However, then we have the Peraturan Nikah and Cerai, you see. Okay? And under this Peraturan Nikah and Cerai, it will list that what actually the form which need to be filled in, uh, how, 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 how much is the fee, if you wanted to get married, you need to uh, pay a certain amount of fees. How much actually is the fees that need to be paid? All these, all these details uh, will be inside the subsidiary legislation. Okay, okay. So let us go on. 
with the next topic. So it seems that uh, the next topic is actually as to what is really the subsidiary legislation. So this subsidiary legislation can take off any form. It can be a proclamation, it can be a memo, it can be a notification. It doesn't matter what it is being named, as long as it has a law enforcement, then this is known as a subsidiary legislation. And, and as I told you earlier, why we have subsidiary legislation, this is because the legislator, the House of Representatives, the state assemblies, they are not an expert, and furthermore, they don't have enough time to do the details. So let the expert do the details, okay? So how is being con controlled? So that's why the subsidiary legislation also need to be publicized. So the next topic, this is regard to the um, unwritten law. So the first unwritten law, because we have just completed with the written law. So the first unwritten law is the judicial decision, which is also known as the judicial binding precedent, a binding judicial precedent. So this means that cases, cases are actually the decision by the judges. So this decision by the judges of the higher court will be binding upon the lower court. Okay? So, and in Malaysia, these are the decisions of the Privy Council, the Federal Court, the Appeal Court, the High Court. So, the decision of this court will be binding upon the lower lower court. And this doctrine is also known as the doctrine of stare decisis. And when, actually, can we use cases? So, when there is no written provision. So, when there is no written provision, then we will refer to these cases. So that's why when we study law, we need to memorize cases. We need to read cases. Why? Because we are being bounded by the, the decision in these cases. These cases which have been decided by the higher, higher court. And this precedent is of two types. First one is a declaratory precedent, meaning once the judges come to the decision, they just declare, uh, give the decision based on the cases which is being put forward to them, okay? So meaning there is already a cases on that certain issue before this. This is known as declaratory precedent. Whereas for original precedent, um, so meaning there is no precedent yet before this. There is no cases which discuss about this matter. This is the first time the judge come across this kind of issue. So under that situation, when the judge wanted to give decision, of course, it will be more difficult because they don't have precedent to be referred to. So meaning the decision will be based on what is actually just and based on equity. Equity is actually what is actually uh, what is actually just, just, just under that situation and uh, the judge will actually use their discretion. Okay. So now let us have a look at the decision by the Privy Council. What is actually a Privy Council? So Privy Council is the highest appeal court for us before 1983. So before 1983, if you go on appeal, yes, so now we can go up to the federal, federal court level. So after federal court, we can appeal anymore. But previously, before 1983, and after uh, we go, to, you go to the federal court. You can still appeal at the Privy Council. The Privy Council is in England. However, in 1983, okay, uh, the, the law has been amended, so we are not we we are not allowed to appeal there. So, meaning the highest appeal court now at the moment is only the federal court. However, the decision by the Fed, Fed by the Privy Council is still binding on us. Walau bagaimanapun, case-case oleh majlis privy ini masih mengikat kita. Okay, so when the decision will be binding upon us, upon Malaysian, Malaysian court. So, especially when the appeal is from Malaysia itself. So, of course, it will be binding upon us. Or the appeal is from other Commonwealth country. So, Commonwealth country is those country which, which is being ruled by the British. So, this is known as the Commonwealth country. And before they gain independence. So this appeal from other Commonwealth country and the law of that Commonwealth country is in perimeter, is, is actually similar to our law. 
And of course, under that situation, they are, that case will be binding on us. So many of uh, our statute is similar to the Indian statute. And because of that, the law here in Malaysia and the law there in India is quite similar. So that's why you know, most of the time you will also be referring to cases from India. Okay. However, the division of the Privy Council itself does not bind the Privy Council. So meaning, if there is a similar issue, let's say from Singapore, and then there is another case and this issue is the same from India. After that, so must, must the judge follow the division from Singapore? No need. Because as I told you just now, uh, the decision does not bind itself. And the decision by the Privy Council will not be binding upon itself. And then, the part of the Privy Council, the decision of the House of Lord. So what is a House of Lord? A House of Lord is the highest appeal court in England. So in Malaysia, if there is a lacuna in our, in our law, so after this, we are going to discuss the uh, English principle. If there is a lacuna in our law, so we can refer to the English law. So meaning we can refer to the English cases. So these English cases are those cases which come from House of Lord, okay? Because House of Lord is the highest appeal court in, in England. Okay, the Federal Court, Federal Court is the highest appeal court in Malaysia. Before 1994, it's known as the Supreme Court. So all the decision by the Federal Court will be binding on all the lower court in Malaysia, meaning it will be binding on the Session Court and on the Magistrate Court because this is all the lower court. And it will be binding upon the high court because in, in the hierarchy, the high court is lower than the federal court. And the decision of the federal court is binding on the federal court itself. So meaning if in 1983, there is one case whereby the issue is similar uh, with the case which appear now in 2020, then the judge of the federal court cannot defer in his decision. It has to follow the decision in 1983, because it discussed with regards to the same issue. It can only differ in the in decision if, let's say, there is a conflict in decision. So let's say in 1983, there is one case, and then in 1990, there is another case. Okay, and there is a conflict of decision in both of these cases. And then under that situation, the federal court can follow either one or can't make a new decision, of course, based on uh, new rulings, okay? And if, let's say, if the decision contradicts with the decision of the Privy Council, let's say that in 1983, there is a case from the Privy Council, right? And then in uh, 1983, the case from Privy Council, the, the decision is like this. And in 1990, there is another case in the Federal Court where, where, whereby the decision differ, contradict with the decision of the Privy Council. And under the situation, the Federal Court now in 2020 can also make a different de decision. And if the decision is per inquirium, per inquirium meaning the decision is wrong, salah, silap, why is it, where, why the decision is per inquirium? Because there are certain precedent or certain statutes, other cases, cases, other akta akta yang not undang, which will not be brought to the attention of the, of the judge. Then under that, this, that situation, the federal court also can actually now make a new new ruling. And because of the previous decision is per inquirium. Silap lah decision yang sebelum ini. So hari ini, yeah, uh, silap sebab apa? Silap sebab ada, ada perkara, ada undang-undang yang tidak dibawa ke pengetahuan mahkamah pada ketika itu. And at the moment now, today, it's been brought, been brought um, before the judge. And under section, judge can make a new ruling. So what about the decision of the High Court? The decision of the High Court is binding on the lower court, it's binding on the Session Court, it's binding on the Magistrate Court. However, it does not bind the High Court. Why? Because we have the High Court in Johor Bahru, one High Court in Ipoh, we have one court. Every state has their own High Court. And let's say there is a decision in Johor Bahru and suddenly now there is one issue in Perak. So must Perak follow the decision in Johor Bahru? No. Why? Because this decision itself, it can goes on appeal, and maybe once it goes on appeal, and maybe the decision will be different. Okay. However, sometimes uh, the judge followed the, the decision of the other high court because of judicial committee, not because they need to follow the decision of that of that high court. Okay. 
That's why. Not because the decision of the High Court is binding or not the High Court. Their decision. Okay, student. So if you look at my slide, we have the division before independence. So I'm not going to discuss about that because that is not that important. Yeah? Because uh, most of the time, you will not be referring to this. Because before independence, this is very old cases. And these cases, and most of our law have been re repealed, with all those law before independence. And um, most of the time, the judges and the court will not be referring to all these cases. So what about the division outside our jurisdiction? So, of course, if it's outside jurisdiction, so let's say it's from another country. So, of course, our court is not bounded to follow this decision. And however, it can be a persuasive. Um, <clears throat> it have a persuasive effect. So, meaning if it's been brought forward by the by uh, by the lawyers, it maybe can persuade the court to give the uh, similar decision. However, they are not bounded by that. So what are the advantages and the disadvantages of this uh, judicial binding precedent? So I think this also you can read it by yourself. <clears throat> the advantages and disadvantages. The, the most important thing about the advantages is that when you look at cases, this is the real situation. If you just read, if you just read the statute, if by reading the statute, the statute will be seems very dry, very difficult to understand. If by looking at the at the uh, division of the judges at the cases, this is a real situation whereby all the statute will be interpreted more clearly. And what is actually the main disadvantages? Because you have to refer to a lot of cases, and sometimes when when there are so many cases to be referred to, there are certain cases whereby whereby uh. The tendency is that the cases we left out, the certain cases we left out. That is the most disadvantages which is being suffered by us if this is what needs to be done. So, uh, since we are discussing about the judicial binding precedent, so now we are going to look at the hierarchy of court. Kita nak tengok hierarchy system susunan mahkamah kat Malaysia, how this actually look like. So, I will start with the uh, lower court first. Okay. So, and the administration of justice, this is a federal matter. Yes, so meaning this is under the jurisdiction of the federal, uh, this is a federal law, federal matters. It's, it's, not, it's not within the jurisdiction of the state. <clears throat> we, uh, we go to the magistrate court first. So the magistrate court, the jurisdiction of a magistrate court. So for criminal jurisdiction, so the, the, the magistrate can hear cases Whereby, if the statute says that the penalty is 10 years imprisonment, a fine, 12 stroke, or uh, um, under that situation, then the magistrate can hear these kind of cases. Okay? So, all, all, all cases, all criminal offences, there are statute which we, which we provide for this, for, for this type of crimes. And whether, we wanted to determine whether the magistrate has the power to listen to hear this case or not, you have to look at what actually the penalty which is being imposed for that case. If the penalty is up to 10 years imprisonment, 12 stroke, okay, then of course the magistrate can actually hear these cases. However, when giving sentence, apabila memberi hukuman, the magistrate can give up to only 5 years imprisonment and fine not more than 10,000 ringgit and not more than 12 stroke. Or combination of any. Combination meaning... Uh, two years imprisonment, let's say the sentence the, given by the magistrate is two years imprisonment, uh, three uh, three thousand ringgit fine, and also two stroke. That is a combination, can also. And magistrate also can hear inquest cases. What is inquest cases? Inquest cases? Inquest cases is actually an inquiry. An inquiry to to find what is the cause of that. In the case of Adi, you can still remember, this is a case in... 2009, 2019, this is a, a fire brigade man. Uh, he was killed you know, when, when trying to, I think, uh, put off fire in a, a certain temple in somewhere in PG, I think. So, we need to know why, why he dies. Is it because of uh, accident or because he's been killed? What is the cause of his death? So this will be determined by the magistrate court, and this is called inquest. Okay, a magistrate have the power to listen to inquest and to decide whether whether uh, a person dies because he's been murdered or because of something else. And what is the civil jurisdiction? 
of a magistrate court. So a magistrate court can uh, hear cases whereby the amount in dispute is not more than 100,000 ringgit. <coughs> and if if this is regard to immobile property, let's say with regards to rent, if you combine the land for one year, uh, you combine the rent for one year, it cannot exceed 100,000 ringgit. Okay. So what about small claims court? In the hierarchy, we have small claims court whereby the uh, power of the small claims court is lower compared to the magistrate court. So these are cases whereby the claim is not more than 10,000 ringgit and the parties cannot be represented by a lawyer. So meaning the parties need to uh, file their own claim and need to uh, need to defend themselves uh, be be without being represented by a lawyer. Okay. Now this is the in the hierarchy. This is the lowest court yeah. of all the courts. Mm -hmm. This is native court. This is only for Sabah and Sarawak. For for uh, West Malaysia, Peninsular Malaysia. Previously we have Penghulu courts, but now we don't have the Penghulu court anymore. It has already been abolished. So in Sabah and Sarawak, this native court, the jurisdiction of the native court is to hear cases uh, with regards to uh, dispute re with regards to uh, dispute regard to their dispute regard to their custom and all the parties are actually native. Okay, and is under scrutinized uh, by the DO, the district officer. So uh, the district officer will supervise and also if there is an appeal, the appeal will go to this DO, to the district officer. So what are the cases which have been tried in this court, in this native court? So breaches of native law, breaches with regard to custom and with regard to land, the land does not have, does not have title. It tak ada grant tanah. Okay. So then under the situation, it, it, the dispute can be here by the native court. So uh, the cases heard by native court is not more than 50 ringgit. And then we have court for children. Court for children. Court for children. These are for court whereby... Uh, it will only try children uh, below 18 years old, 18 years old, and for criminal cases only. Why? For civil cases, uh, it cannot be tried in this court because children which is below 18 years old, they cannot enter into a contract. Okay? So that's why uh, there is no civil cases tri uh, trial for a juvenile, for children. So this uh, court for children consists of a magistrate and a two lay person, a normal person who does not have uh, law law knowledge as an advisor to this magistrate. And of course, one of these advisors must be a woman. And these cases which have been trial uh, in the court for children, it will be in camera. In camera meaning that outsiders uh, spectators is not allowed to be to be there to listen to the cases. So who will be there? Uh, the, the person will be there is only the prosecutor and the child and also the lawyer for the child. Okay? And um, if there are appeals, the appeals will go to the high, high court. Though this is criminal matters, it is the same thing whereby if it involves cases whereby the penalty is a death sentence, now, under the situation, it cannot be heard under this court for children because this court for children is actually at par with the magistrate court. Okay, so meaning if it involves a uh, death sentence, death penalty, the case need to be heard uh, at the high court level. Okay, the second court is actually the highest lower court. So meaning in the hierarchy, for lower court, is this is the highest court. It will be preceded by the session court judge, formerly is known as the as the session court president. What is the criminal jurisdiction of this court? It can hear all types of cases and can impose any sentence except those cases whereby the penalty is a death sentence. So meaning, so cases with regards to traffic, uh, uh, with this uh, fire 
uh, Fire Under Firearms Act, Dangerous Drug Act, uh, and murder cases cannot be heard here. Why? Because uh, the penalty is a death sentence. So these cases can only be heard by the High High Court. For civil jurisdictions, as the session court charge can hear cases up to uh, 1 million ringgit. If the dispute is not more than 1 million ringgit, it can be heard here at the uh, session court. So what are those cases, those civil cases whereby the uh, session court is not allowed to hear? So example is like probate and administration of estate, eh, case case to pusaka, divorce matters. This is for non-Muslim, bankruptcy matters and enforcement of trust. So these type of cases need to be heard by the High Court. And this uh, session court also plays a supervisory role. They supervise all the other lower court. Okay, now let us go on with the High Court. The High Court, we have the two chief judges because we have the High Court of Sabah and Sarawak and also the High Court of Peninsula Malaysia. So that, that's why we have the chief judges for the High Court for Sabah and Sarawak and also the High Court of the Peninsula of Malaysia. So, okay. So now we are going to go on with the uh, next topic. Huh? We are still in the High Court. So the High Court comprising of 50 judges and also the Judicial Commissioner, more than 50 judges we have here in Malaysia. What are the original jurisdiction of the High Court? The High Court has an unlimited civil and criminal powers. So meaning all cases can be filed here. For civil cases, of course, the claim must exceed 100,000 ringgit. That if this is the first time the case is being heard. Okay, for all criminal matters, are, are all those cases whereby the penalty is a death sentence. And so, cases which occur at the high seas or or in the airspace can be heard here. And also, with regards to piracy, because pirates does not have citizenship, can also be heard here. So, what is the appellate jurisdiction of the High Court? So, the High Court can hear all appeal from the lower court. And also, the High Court has the supervisory and revisionary jurisdiction. What is this? The High Court supervises the lower court, and at the same time, they can review the decision by the lower lower court. So this is what the judges will do. Okay, they have power to do this. So now, let us have a look at the appeal court. Appeal court is presented by the Court of Appeal, and they have eight judges here. So, if for the High Court, only one judge will be listening to the case. For Appeal Court, it will be uh, either three, five, or seven judges, but most of the time it will be three judges. Okay, here. Dalam nombor ganje. Why? Because that because they, if they wanted to uh, come to a decision, they will uh, listen to the majority. Okay. So, what is the original of the Appeal Court? Of course, this is Appeal Court. They hear uh, appeal cases and all uh, criminal appeal goes here also here from the High Court and for civil matters. Of course, it must be uh, the amount must be more than 250,000 ringgit. Okay? And then this is the highest court, the highest court, which is a federal court whereby we have the uh, Chief Justice, the President of the Court of Appeal, the Chief Judge of Sabah and Sarawak and all the six federal court judges will be here similar to the appeal court the the judge will be sitting in at this number whether uh three three person five percent seven percent but most of the time only three percent will be sitting because we don't have enough judges what is the original jurisdiction of this court so they will de determine whether the law which will be made by the legislature is really or not okay if there is a dispute with regard to certain law whether that law is ultra virus or not ultra virus, meaning the law which we made is beyond the power. Okay, so they will decide whether it's valid or not. Or if there is dispute between state and another state, or between the state and the federal government, so that dispute will also be heard here. And at the same time, the federal court also have a referral jurisdiction whereby if there is a question of law, 
from the high court will be referred here to be decided by the federal court or maybe certain question is be referred by the young Petuan Agong, especially with regards to the constitution. And of course, the uh, federal court have the power to hear appeals from the appeal courts and also from the high court. Okay, so now, so then let us go on with special court. This court is only for, for the ruler, okay? So it's for the rule of the common states of Malaysia and also concerning the king. So meaning this is a court to hear co cases concerning the young Bhutan Agung, the sultan of uh, each state, or the young Tuan Musa, or the chief minister of the state. And this is being checked by a chief justice of the federal court. And apart from that, uh, there are, will be four other members, meaning five of them, whereby the other four members, the two is the two chief justice of the respective five courts, the the chief judge of Sabah and Sarawak, and also the chief judge of uh, Peninsula Malaysia, and two others are being appointed by the Conference of Ruler, uh, appointed by the Majlis Raja Raja. Okay, so that person, the other two, which is appointed by the Conference of Ruler, of course, they before this must hold the office as a judge. Okay, this is actually what you are looking now at your slide. This is a hierarchy of courts in the form of diagram. So by looking at this diagram, you can understood what is being discussed uh, just now much more clearly. So we can see that the lowest court is a native court and we go up. Uh, we have small claims court and then magistrate court and insurance court. Whereby I've told you just now is at par with the magistrate court and the session court. All this court is known as the lower court or the inferior court. And then we have the uh, high court, which is the lowest in the hierarchy of the higher court, the appeal court, the federal court, and then I put it in red. This is special court, and this is not for a lay person like us. This is for the ruler of 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 the state. So now let us go on with the um, unwritten law, the second unwritten law, which is actually the principle of English law. <clears throat> so if there is a lacuna in our law, so meaning uh, by look, going through all the statute. There is a loophole in our law, so meaning there is no provision with regard to certain matters that under that situation, what we need to do, what, what the judges need to do. So under that situation, the judges will be referring to the English law. And what are actually the law which gave them power to do this? This is actually is being enshrined in Section 3 and Section 5 of the Civil Law Act 1956. And for all civil cases, so for criminal cases, we are not allowed to do this. And uh, for land matters also, we are not allowed to do this. It's, this is only for all other civil cases and also, also for commercial matters. So section three, <coughs> section three is for civil cases, for all other civil cases, example, family law, okay, law, uh, uh, law of trust, okay. So these are all other civil cases. So even for commercial matters, so let's say insurance law, sale of goods, okay, all these are all adequate commercial matters. It is being uh, provided under Section 5 of the Civil Law Act 1956. So let's say there is a lacuna with regard to civil matters. <clears throat> In accident cases, let's say, uh, because an accident cases is actually not commercial matters. There is a lacuna. Then under that situation, for West Malaysia, for us in Peninsula Malaysia, if there is lacuna, we will be referring, the judges will be referring to the law in England, common law and equity, meaning they will be referring to the cases there in England as 1956, 7 April of 1956. So meaning they are not going to be referring to the cases, the latest cases in England. However, they are going to be referring to these very old cases, cases before we gain independence. So that's why I said, when there is a lacuna, most probably there won't be a lacuna at all because our law also have, 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 uh, have come to the stage whereby we have been um, <coughs> enacting many laws and all those laws which actually is not um, suitable have been repealed. However, if let's say there is a lacuna, then under that situation, okay, then what we what the judges will be doing for for Peninsula Malaysia, they will be referring to these old cases in England. For Sabah, so not only they will be referring to cases for common law and equity, however, they will also be referring to statute, meaning they will be referring to the 
to the act there in England, however, as at 1st December 1951. Uh, so meaning, this is much more older compared to Peninsular Malaysia. And for Sarawak, it's similar as Sabah, similar in the form of not only the judges is allowed to be referring to cases, they are also allowed to refer to statute, to the acts there in England. However, as at 12 December 1949. Yeah, however, you have to bear in mind, as, as I told you just now, only if there is a lacuna. If there is no lacuna, we are not allowed to refer to the English cases, to the English law. <laughs> so let's say there is division, the English division, and, and there is a contradiction between the common law and also the law of equity. And common law meaning the law which is based on statute there in England and then equity, this is the law which is based on what is actually fair and just by looking at the circumstances of the case and the judge is using their discretion in giving the decision. So if there is a contradiction between these two judgments, then under that situation, we will be <coughs> giving priority to the equity decision, meaning we are going to use the equity decision, the equity case. <coughs> Again, I have to remind you student, we are going to do this if there is a lacuna. If there is no lacuna, we are not going to refer to the English principle. Of course, we are going to give priority to our own law. And land matters, we are not going to we are not going to refer to the English law. Uh, we are going to refer to our own national land code. Okay, for commercial matters, let's say involving insurance, involving um, sale of goods, higher purchase, and so on. All these are considered as commercial matters. So this is covered by Section 5, Subsection 1, and Subsection 2 of the Civil Law Act. For West Malaysia, <coughs> for Peninsula Malaysia, except for Malacca and Penang, you know that Malacca and Penang is a straight settlement before, before we gain independence. So for West Malaysia, of course, we are going to be referring to the English law as at date of the act, meaning as at 1956, similar as to civil matters 1956 many very very old case right so if there is a lacuna in our law with regards to the commission matters what what the judges will be doing they will be referring to these cases uh those cases which has been decided before 1956 however in malacca penang sabah and sarawak if there is a lacuna with regards to with regards to this commercial matter then under that situation they'll be referring the cases in England as at the date of the trial. So let's say the case is being heard on the 1st of January 2020. So they will be referring to the case that in England as at January 2020, 1st January 2020. So meaning they will be referring to the latest case there in England. So of course, under the situation, if let's say a, a similar issue occur in Para and also in Malacca, the decision might differ. Why? Because in Malacca, the decision will be based on this in, the latest English law in England compared to Para. Because in Para, they will be referring to those cases in 1956. Okay. So now, we are going to go to the last topic under unwritten law, which is customary law and also Islamic law. So for this customary law, <clears throat> this is only applicable for marriage, divorce, and hereditament. Harta pusaka lah. Mewarisi, ya. Okay. For for the Malays, of course, they will be using the adat perpati and adat temenggu. Adat perpati is for certain state in, in Malaysia, like the uh, Negeri Milan and uh, Naning in Malacca, whereby it is maternal in characteristic, or whereby, whereby other state they are going to use this adat temenggu for, for this uh, Malay of other state. For Sabah and Sarawak, as, as you know earlier, they have native court. So native court will be the one who, who uh, will be administering with regard to the native law there. For Chinese, Indian and other races, okay, since 1976, we have the Law Reform Marriage and Divorce Act. So this act is applicable for all non-Muslims, so mean, meaning if they wanted to to get married or they wanted to divorce, they have to follow the provision of this act. Okay, 
So just now I was telling you for for the Malays we have ada pepati ada temenggong so so what is ada pepati you can just glance through through my notes okay where I say this is a uh, maternal meaning the mother side is being given more priority. However, for penalty, the penalty is more towards arbitration and humanity. Okay, so it wanted to rehabilitate the person who commit the offence and not to penalize him. This is very different from Arat Temenggong. So Arat Temenggong, <clears throat> it will follow, the, the, the sentence says the penalty will be will follow according to law. So for Arat Temenggong, if you murder some, somebody, then of course you, you the, the sentence is that sentence. So however, for Arat Pepate, if you murder somebody, then maybe, maybe under the situation, uh, they're not going to be sentenced to death. However, yeah, under that situation, of course, uh, maybe uh, they will decide that okay, you take care of the family of the deceased, menjaga uh, keluarga si mati. Because because why actually you have killed the uh, breadwinner of the family, so now who are going to take care of the family? So that is adat pun pati, which is based more on humanity. So let us have a look at Sharia law. So Sharia law is actually within the jurisdiction of the state. Islam, of course, is the region of the federation and the sultan is the head of region of, of his state. And for those states which does not have sultan, of course, Yang the Petuan Agong will be the head of that um, of that state. And under Article 1 to 1 of the federal constitution, 1 to 1, sub 1 A says, civil court does not have jurisdiction over Islamic matters. So meaning all Islamic matters with regards to marriage, custody, murtad, and so on, it need to be heard by the Sharia court. And just now I said, Sharia matters is a state jurisdiction. However, though, though it is within the state jurisdiction, this court okay, cannot give sentences which actually contravene, meaning the enactment, the state law, Say, say the Undang-Undang Keluarga Islam Perak, Undang-Undang Keluarga uh, Islam Kelantan, whatsoever, cannot against the cannot go against the provision of the Constitution because the Constitution gave power for this Sharia court eh, since it's amend amended 1984. The jurisdiction is up to fine up to 5,000 ringgit, imprisonment up to six months and six, six stroke or combination of any of that. So that's why when Kelantan wanted to impose this hudud law, they need to go to the um, parliament level, right? Because they are requesting so that the constitution be amended so that this uh, jurisdiction be increased. Okay, so that's why until today, hudud law cannot be enforced in Kelantan because the constitution is not amended. Okay, and this uh, Sharia Court, and we have the Sharia Lower Court, Sharia High Court, and Sharia Appeal Court. So they are not binded by this uh, doctrine of judicial binding precedent, okay? So they are not binded by that because every state, the jurisdiction is different according to their enactment. And these Sharia court, <clears throat> they have a power to hear civil and criminal matters pertaining to Islamic law. So the civil matters pertaining to um, maybe a claim for custody, for harvest, pencarian, for muta, all these are civil matters, criminal matters. Um, <clears throat> so let's say um, a zina, okay, and that uh, consuming of of consuming of alcohol. All these are criminal matters. So that's why you can see that the sentences is different from one state and another state. Because why? Because this is a state matter, okay. So apart from a person who uh, wanted to become a counsel, a lawyer. Okay, in this court, they wanted to represent their client. Not only they have must have the academic qualification, they also must have this practicing certificate which depends on each state. Okay, before they can appear on this Sharia court. So what are the sources of Sharia law? Of course, the Quran, Sunnah, Ijma, and Qiyas. So Quran, of course, everybody know what is Quran. Quran is truly, the Muslim believe that this is a direct words of Allah. It's been transmitted through Rasulullah. Okay, and this is the main source, the fundamental source. However, if the Quran is not clear, then only you are going to go through Sunnah and Hadith. So, we believe that the Sunnah and Hadith is the tradition 
uh, done by practice of the Prophet Muhammad and it's been recorded in the volume of Hadith. Okay? Uh, and um, if something is not clear in the Quran, then we are going to look uh, based on Hadith. And what is Ijma? Ijma is consensus. Persetujuan bersama by the ulama. In Malaysia, we have the Majlis Fatwa. Okay? So they will make rulings. So, so let's say certain matters is not clear by looking at the Quran, looking at Hadith, is still